Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, here we are again. Um, my kids are starting to think this is all I do um, when I tell them I've got, got a webinar. Another webinar. We got to be quiet. Yep, you got to be quiet. But um, here we are again. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, if you're a first timer, welcome. If you've been um, playing along with us here for the last uh, month and a half or so, um, appreciate you, um, you know, continuing to come back. Hopefully, every all the content's been um, what you've been looking for and, and learning some things. Uh, today, we're going to be tackling uh, root cause um, and kind of determining once you know you've got a problem, you know, what do you do next? How do you keep that problem from happening again? Um, so we've got Sean Eisenhower back with us again today from Iridicio. Um, those of you that have been around the, the conference circuit, I'm sure you've seen Sean present and, and probably even seen him talk uh, RCA. It is definitely a passion topic for him. So it should be a good session today. Before we <clears throat> get started, just reiterate again that um, we, you know, UE Systems here, we're, we're definitely wanting to be a support for, for you guys um, while you're maybe having a different work experience. Um, so if you're finding yourself working from home, um, you know, we'd, we'd still love to be able to support you and help you continue to, to build on your program, help you with procedures, help you with your software, um, whatever the case may be. Uh, we're definitely looking looking forward to, to continuing to support our customers and, and get get some time with you guys on, you know, go to meetings or Zooms or whatever you guys want to do. So take us up on that, please. We are we are very anxious and happy to talk to talk to people other than those in our homes, right? Um, so and to that point as well, um, just another reminder that these webinars we've been doing are kind of part of a bigger program that we've been involved in with um, Iridicio and um, RDI who presented yesterday. Um, so Iridicio's got a website they've created, um, help.iridicio.com. So all of these webinars we've been doing, they're all um, archived over there, as well as some additional um, no-cost project-based learning opportunities, a lot of videos, they've got templates, um, e-learning modules, all kinds of stuff over there that, that you guys should definitely take advantage of while it's still there. Um, and then also they have um, some of their coaches available for no cost coaching hours, which is just a really awesome offering and, and, and do not hesitate to take advantage of that. I really think you'd, you'd find a lot of value and benefit from getting to spend some time with, with the, the coaches from your DCO who can help you um, with whatever it is you might be trying to work on at this time. So um, just know that that is there for you all. And um, a couple of little housekeeping things. So, you know, as I mentioned, we've been archiving all these webinars. So we are recording this one today. Um, so if you got to hop off or if you've got a colleague that couldn't make it, we'll we'll have this up on our YouTube station um, later today. And, and they'll have it again on that um, help.iridicio.com site as well. So you can check that out um, if, if need be. Um, we certainly welcome questions, so you can type those into the questions box throughout. I'll be keeping an eye on those. Um, we're also um, going to be having some poll questions that Sean's going to ask, so you'll see those will pop up on your screen, and we'd love for you to, you know, partake in those and interact with us. Um, just know that when you when those do launch, if you have your screen minimized, it won't let you answer the question. So you do need to make sure your screen is is maximized in order for those polls to work. Um, but uh, it wouldn't be an Iridicio presentation without a little bit of interaction. It's their thing. So uh, we'll look forward to to getting to do a little bit of that. And of course, you know, this is live. As I mentioned, the, I got the kids, I got dogs. You know, everybody's been well behaved so far the last couple months. But uh, if they aren't, I apologize. Um, and uh, of course, if we have any audio issues or internet issues, just know that we'll we'll jump on those as quick as we can and and get them uh, resolved. But uh, just bear with us if we have any of those issues, and hopefully, we won't. So with that, Sean, I'm going to turn the screen over to you, and we'll let you take it away. Thank you much, Maureen. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go full screen here, and Maureen, do we look okay? Looks good. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, excited to be back here, excited to spend a little more time with you guys. We've talked a lot 
about planning and scheduling and we've looked at the ultrasonic tools and we looked at RDI's awesome technology that they have and, and being able to visualize movement and motion. So uh, it's been kind of a fun, uh, a fun series uh, in Prompt 2, but nonetheless fun. Uh, but you got to ask yourself, as you go through and find the problems that you're finding, what are you doing to make sure that they don't reoccur? Make what are you doing to make sure that you're not having to face those same issues, maybe on a different piece of equipment, but the same issues over and over. So today we're going to take you down that path. It's a really nice follow up to a lot of the other content that UE Systems and RDI have shared with us. And I, I hope it'll kind of help you as you think about where your predictive program is and then your overarching reliability program and where you want to take it moving forward. So with that said, we'll get started. A little bit about me. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Sean Eisenhower. I'm one of the partners with Iridicio. Um, That's my daughter over in the corner of the picture there. Uh, she's grown up a bit since then, but uh, this is just a little bit about me. Uh, I've got a reliabilitynow.com blog that has over 200 blog posts categorized by different topics. So if you're looking for things uh, to share with others in the organization, that can be a good place to go to do it. Uh, outside of work, I really enjoy uh, playing with things that, well, quite frankly, could kill me. Uh, so I am a helicopter pilot, an airplane pilot, and occasionally I do race cars when I don't tear them up. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do. But the reason I bring those up is really because those are the kind of examples of where reliability is super important. And so I, I get to take a lot of the stuff that we talk about here and carry it right over into some of my hobbies. Uh, down in the bottom corner there, you see me diffusing uh, a bomb. That's actually here in the room that I'm standing in at the moment. Uh, that was for one of our e-learning uh, videos. So one of the things we do a lot of at Iridicio is, is creating blended learning. And so we use video, we use e-learning, we use augmented reality, we use traditional face-to-face -face as well as webinars and other things. Uh, and this was just a fun time we were having uh, creating a bomb for one of those videos. And if you look real close, those are actually two Pringles cans, an iPhone, and what's left of my old air conditioning unit. So we'll go ahead and get started and get into the topics, but I, I wanted to at least introduce myself a little bit so that if I use stories and examples, you'll know kind of where I'm coming from. With that said, let's hear a little bit about you. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Maureen go ahead and launch the first poll. And what I'm looking for here is, how are you doing with reliability? So as you look and think about where your organization is, take us through what level of maturity you are. And Maureen, I'll let you tell them whether the one is high or low in the five, because I cannot remember. Okay, we did one being, you know, the least mature and five being the most. And I may have goofed when I said you need to be have your screen maximized. It could be that it needs to be minimized, but just if it's not working the way you're trying it, try it the other way. <laughs> Sorry, I think I've got I've got quarantine brain, so um, <laughs> apologies if I screwed that up. <laughs> All right, but the votes are coming in stuff. here. We'll give you guys just about, a second, give you guys just yeah. a second to respond. The fives, of course, <laughs> are going to be those of you that are rock stars in reliability. And those ones are going to be those of you who, well, you know, got a little room for improvement. All right. So we're, we've got about 60% of the folks have voted and they're falling right in the middle. You got about um, the majority, 46% are at a three. Um, you got 19% at a four, 22% at a two. Um, we got a solid 8% at a five. So those guys are doing great. And then about 7% at a one. All right, very good. Thank you, Maureen. So it's good to hear. We got a we got a nice mix on here, but it sounds like a lot of you are right in that middle range. So when you're living in that middle range, that is a great time to really start to talk about root calls and predictive maintenance and some of those things because you hopefully have the underlying systems in place. 
you've got planning and scheduling in place, you've got work control and you know how a work order moves through the system and people know that there's an expectation to use work orders. So for you threes, this really ought to resonate. And then for you fours and fives, this could be something where you're just gonna do a little bit of tweaking. And for you ones and twos, this becomes part of your master plan. This becomes part of where you wanna go next as you start implementing things moving forward. All right. Thank you, Maureen, for that poll. So we're gonna do a little bit of a test here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take you guys through some predictive maintenance or condition-based maintenance techniques that have been used and they found problems. And I've got different ones here. I've got some animated ones from our e-learning content, but I also have some real pictures uh, from different places. So I'm gonna play each of them. And what I want you to do in your head is just kind of think about what you're seeing and, and what I'm describing on each of the slides as we go through here. And I want you to think, what is the root cause? What, you know, why did that happen? Now, as you go through and do that, I do understand you don't have all the details and you can't see the full situation. So it's okay to be a little creative, but I just want you to think about where would you list or what would you say from a root cause standpoint? So let's look at the first one here. It's a bearing and I'm going to go ahead and start the bearing playing and you'll see the bearing rotating. All right, most of you should see the bearing rotating at this point and you see the bearing has now been taken apart. So, so this is a bearing that ultrasonic said was failing said there was something wrong with it. This thing is noisy. So what we've done is we've taken it, we've cut it apart, we've cleaned it up a little, and this is what we have left over. And you can kind of see what's going on there. I'll describe it again in a few minutes, but take a quick look and, and, and see what you think. And then tell me, you know, in your mind, you can write it down on a piece of paper or just file it away in your head. What do you think the root cause is for this problem? All right, we're going to go to another one. So in this one, what we got on the work order was the motor locked up. All right, so this one, we didn't catch it with a predictive maintenance uh, tool, or if we did, we didn't get it replaced in time. So let's take a look and see what we can see here. All right, hopefully you guys are seeing now what's happening on that uh, that motor that locked up or that bearing that, that caused that motor to lock up. Try to think about what the root cause might be here. And I know it depends on the industry and that sort of thing. So just come up with one that you believe is kind of a root cause. All right, we're going to keep moving. I've got one more. This is one of my personal favorites. It's the wrong tool. It's There's a lot going on here but I'm gonna play this video for you. And again, we just replaced it. And here I am as a predictive maintenance guy saying, well, good luck, you get to do it again. So let's see why they get to do it again. And you think about what the root cause might be in this problem. Now, I know none of you folks on this call install bearings with a hammer. That's probably one of the plants down the road or somebody you know or have heard about. We in the industry like to call this the opposite of precision maintenance. We call it percussion maintenance. So in this situation, what we've done is we've hit it with a hammer and we've done it fairly blatantly. But in your world, this is when you can't get the bearing up on the shaft. So you take a hammer and give it a little tap to get it to go right up on there. Um, or you use a, a chisel or a punch uh, and do the same thing with the hammer, chisel, and punch combination. Uh, so you got, a, you got a little bit more information on this one. I've shared just a few more details. Now here's one more, and I'm going to stop here and uh, let you think again about what you're seeing. Now I have given you some additional detail in this case. So uh, as a predictive maintenance guy, I have cut the bearing open. I have taken a look at what's going on and I have dug a little deeper into it. What I'd like for you to do is still think about it. Have I given you the root cause or is there more to it? I'll give you just a second.
All right. So what we're going to do now is, Maureen, I'm going to have you launch poll question number two. And if you can read it to them, please. All right. So here we go. It is uh, when your predictive texts make a call, what are you provided? Nothing. We don't do PDM. Just that it is bad. It is bad and it could be for this reason. It's bad. It could have been caused by X. Check and verify. And you know what, Sean? Your, these responses were too long. I guess it got cut off, but it didn't tell me that when I set it up. But basically... Okay. So I'll rehash it a little bit. That, yeah. that first level there, what I'm looking for there is, hey, man, we don't do PDM. It's not something we spend a lot of time on. Um, the next level in, it's bad. You know, hey, you need to go replace the bearing in that gearbox. It's bad. Uh, the next level up, you're giving a, they're giving you a little more detail. Um, so here now we're starting to talk about what uh, what might have caused it or what the guys might want to look at. And then that highest level is drilling down into the RCA. All right, Maureen, I'll let you tell us what um, they thought. Yeah. So it looks like we've got about the majority, 43% of them are saying it's bad and it could be for this reason. 32% are, are the last option. It's bad and kind of giving potential reasons for why. 15% um, that it just is and 11% nothing. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. So that gives us kind of an idea from my perspective. I, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. So years ago, I worked for uh, a little gas company called Exxon Mobil and, and, and spending time with them, I worked in a really interesting facility um, in the plastics industry, in the chemical side of the business. And in that facility, we were, um, we were setting up and continuing to improve a predictive maintenance program. And uh, so, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do as we went through, and the guys were really good at this, but one of the things we wanted to do was to get past those calls that say it's bad. Um, we started cutting a lot of bearings open and taking a look at the insides, uh, trying to understand what's happening or how, what that bearing's being exposed to. And this picture that you have on the screen is one of the first bearings. I did not take this picture, but it's, it's one of the first failures or types of failure that we saw when we started cutting those bearings open. And uh, it's typically caused uh, by a passage of current, as it says, through the bearing, but there's actually some underlying reasons that that happens. And it can be that we're um, in a situation where there are no grounding brushes on the motor and electrical current is traveling through the bearing instead of uh, going through the grounding brushes. Uh, this happens a lot when you take a standard duty motor and put it on a variable frequency drive. Uh, that's one of the ways that I see this uh, many, many, many times because the motor was already there, was already existing, and when we put the VFD on, we did not put anything in there to to allow grounding to occur. Um, we also, though, see it when someone grounds a welder and that current travels through uh, the bearing. So that's another way that you can see this. And then one way I've seen only a, a couple of times over the years was where you actually had a situation where uh, magnetic current was induced. Uh, and so that that's a pretty unique situation. But those first two are very, very common in industry. So my point here is I've given you not just that the bearing failed, not just that the bearing failed because electrical current traveled through it, but I've given you that next step. I've said, you know, hey, here are some things you need to look for. Has there been any welding in the area? Is this a variable frequency drive connected to an older motor? So that gives me a, a place to look. So that's kind of the first part of drilling down into these problems. Now we'll dive a little deeper in a second, but I wanna take you back through the other two and we'll talk about each of those. So I'm gonna back back up to where we started and you got a second to kind of work through them earlier. The first one that I showed you is actually just 
a, a lubrication issue. It is the fact that there was dirt and debris on the grease fitting. No one wiped the grease fitting off. They just put their grease gun down on top of it. And that little bit of debris and dirt that was trapped up there on top of the grease fitting was pushed right down into that bearing. Uh, and you can see the pitting that was caused and the damage that was caused to the inner outer race and the uh, balls. So there's still more to it, but I wanted to give you a bigger part of the picture now that you've worked through a little bit of the exercise. Now the second one here, the motor locked up, and I'll give you a little bit more detail this time. So the motor locked up, the motor locked up because water was being pushed into this motor. Now, there, there's more to it than just that water being pushed in because there were seals there, there were things to protect this. And in this case, I like to think that uh, there was one of our fine operations folks or one of the sanitation crews coming through with hot pressure water or hot high pressure water and they saw a little grease on the shaft so they thought they'd just flip it over there and kind of wash that area down for you to help you out. Um, but that's the kind of thing that might introduce this issue moving forward. And then the, the, the one that I showed you next was the uh, hammer being used to uh, install the bearing. And again, this happens a lot. I see it I, I see it in a lot of facilities still today where they haven't taken the time to reach out and, and get a bearing installation tool. They don't have a bearing heater available. So they get into that situation where the best they can do is to hit it with a hammer. All right. So then we talked about this one and we talked about what could introduce some of it. I'm going to take you through a few more. I'm going to move fairly fast through these, but I wanted to just show a lot of things that you could find with the predictive tools, but not necessarily get to the root cause right out of the gate. So here on your screen now is a, um, a bearing. You're looking at the outer race. You're actually looking at what is false burnelling. So of course, this would be very, very prominent in vibration. It would be very, very prominent in ultrasound. Um, and so you would be able to pick this up fairly early. Now I have run into this in my career a couple of different, probably 10 or 15 different times. Um, it can happen because you've got a piece of equipment that is spare in place and it sits and it never rotates and it's vibrating or shaking because of other assets in the area. Uh, that's one of the ways that I've seen this. Another one that's pretty common uh, is when you store parts in a storeroom for an extended period of time and over that period of time, uh, it sits there and vibrates. And in one instance up in Pennsylvania, I had a facility where they had stored the bearings on a shelf right next to a wall. And on the other side of that wall was a railroad track. So as those trains came through, that little bit of shaking every day would be transferred into those bearings. And that can also cause a pattern very similar to what you see here. So we refer to it as false Brunelli. It's, it's really the opposite of the true Brunelling side that we saw with the bearing and hammer installation. Um, but it's another one of those issues where if I just say, oh, yeah, the bearing's bad, or I say, oh, the bearing's false Brunelled, I don't know enough about it to prevent it from reoccurring. Couple more. Oh, the oil sample looks awful. You guys need to change the oil in that gearbox. But in reality, if we dive a little deeper down into that oil sample, we've got really good evidence contained there. Uh, and that evidence may be some of the things you see here on the bottom of the screen. This one happens to be uh, imperfections where they popped out, almost like looking at a pothole that's come out all in one piece, uh, right out of a race or a bearing, uh, in or out of race, or even some other components uh, like gears and other things. So this one here likely occurred from shock impacts. Uh, but again, we still got to figure out, you know, what caused that shock. Here's one more, and this is a worn uh, gear, a worn gear set. It shows up really nice in vibration, shows up really nice both in the time waveform and the, the fast Fourier transform, the FFT. And uh, so we know what's going on in there, but there's nothing here in the report that tells us why it happened. 
what introduced this issue? Did we have a lubrication issue? Did we have a contamination issue? Is it uh, a component that wasn't designed for the load? There's a lot of different things that we could consider and start diving deeper into. Whereas a lot of times what I see is predictive maintenance guys basically just saying the gearbox needs to be replaced. Uh, abrasive wear. The other one I showed you was from shock loads. This is uh, a little bit more from those oil samples and we dig a little deeper. It looks a lot different than what we saw over there with the shock loads. This more than likely is going to be caused by something getting into that gearbox, either sand, dirt, debris, whatever that case may be. It gets between those metal surfaces and it produces something that looks like the material you would find in a machine shop. Uh, except it's really small and it's in your oil. So uh, with that said, this oil has a really big story to tell. And that's one of the things that I love to share with folks, because I think many times people think that we do oil samples simply to know if the oil needs to be replaced. And therefore, if they have a small gearbox, they won't do oil samples because there's not enough oil to justify the cost. But in reality, what we're using that oil sample for is this, this evidence that we can use to drill down into the root causes and understand why we're having the failures that we're having. Now I've got just a couple more. I didn't want to leave out any technologies. I tossed in one from uh, infrared here. Actually, there's two in here from infrared. Again, you're, you're seeing uh, a definite temperature increase across this uh, two set or this set of bearings. Um, and what we know is that there is excessive belt tension here, uh, probably because the pulley was worn out and the belt was slipping. So somebody said, well, that belt needs to be tightened up. Let me go ahead and take care of it. And they've tightened that belt up real good for you, uh, probably about banjo string tight. And what you're seeing is the force being transferred into that bearing and then causing that heat load to go up. Uh, this is bad for a lot of reasons um, and, and in a lot of different ways, but it's a great example of where we don't have a bad bearing here. You can put another bearing back into this application. Well, you have a bad bearing, but when you put another new bearing into this application, you'll have another bad bearing in a very short period of time. So this is a great example of where you get, you know, in the swing of things and your predictive technologies are out there and they're finding things and they're like, Hey guys, go change this. Hey guys, go change that. But what doesn't really get taken care of is the real root of the problem. And because of that, they keep occurring. The guys keep having good finds. Everybody celebrates the predictive maintenance is working, but we're still having more repairs and more downtime than we should. All right, so let's take a couple more looks here. This is a great little piece of evidence here. Um, it is the inner race of a bearing, but what it actually tells us upon further inspection is that we didn't just have a bearing fail. We actually had spalling occur specifically in one zone of that bearing indicating a very likely chance of misalignment. So that gives us a step down into the next level of root cause, which is where we're going to spend some of our time here in the next few minutes. One last look, infrared. So here we've got a bad connection, uh, possibly a loose connection, uh, depending on whether the fastener is loose or it's pulled through on the back side or even uh, corrosion or a few other problems that could have occurred here. But what we have for sure is the indication of resistance and the heat load associated. So again, we, we know we have a problem here, but do we know what caused it? Do we know where it came from? All right, so what I'd like to do before we leave this slide is Maureen, if you'll launch poll three, what I wanna know is how many of you, when you looked at those first three or four slides, how many of you jumped right to what we'll call a physical cause? And I'm gonna describe these as Maureen's bringing this poll up. But a physical cause is something you can see. Oh, the bearing failed. Oh, they hit it with a hammer. Oh, it uh, was over tightened or it was under tightened. Uh, those are all very much physical causes. Now, there are causes other than those, and we're going to dive into those in more detail in a few minutes. But the next level down from physical is what we call human causes. So how many of you said, oh, Billy Bob didn't do what he was supposed to do? 
And that's the problem right there. If, if Billy Bob hadn't sprayed all that water into that bearing, we wouldn't have had this problem. So that's a human cause. As we go a little bit deeper down into it, we start to get into what we call the systemic causes. I like to think of these as the causes that allow the physical causes to happen. And then the most deep, deep level is the latent causes. And that's the organizational things that allowed it to happen as you looked at it. So take a look at the questions and um, let's go ahead and take it take a, just a second to tell me whether you stopped at the physical causes, the human causes, or if you got down into some of those organizational and procedural latent and systemic issues. Great. Well, you got a majority of folks um, are down at the bottom there um, looking into the more systemic um, causes for this um, at about 45%. And about 39% are um, diving deeper into the human causes, and then 18% kind of stops at the physical. So, okay, very good. Very good. Well, and and I appreciate the feedback. That really helps. So that means I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little deeper into this next slide or these next two slides and talk a little more about this. So one of the things that I, I see as I do a lot of assessments in different facilities uh, is that as I go in and, and start uh, looking at their root calls program, I'll ask some pretty you know pretty basic questions. How many root calls analysis? Um, have you done over the last couple years? Uh, where have you focused? Those sort of things. And, and inevitably, when I start pulling up the RCA reports, I see mostly those physical causes. Now, in some of those locations, and this is a tough one because it, it can lead to some really bad habits, they like to stop at the human level. And some of you indicated that you do the same thing. So, when you get to that human level, what you're basically saying is somebody did something wrong. And uh, that, you know, I, I once worked in an organization that was that way. They didn't really want to stop at the physical causes. They wanted to make sure they knew who to blame and when to blame them. And because of that, I created something somewhat in jest, but I created something I call the somebody's fault tree. Now, the somebody's fault tree was my way of protecting the people who live in an organization that wants to take their root cause only to the human level. So in this example, something went wrong in the plant. There are basically three branches. It can be your fault. It can be not my fault or it can be their fault. And these are color coded to help you remember when to use which one. If you're feeling pretty comfortable, this is the red one. Uh, that means it's gonna be your hardest to pull off. You better be careful. Um, but this one, you can accuse someone else of doing something wrong. Now I've added a few things in here and I'm gonna read some of them off. And I want you to think about in your facility, how many times have you heard people say these things? You did it and I can prove it. You didn't follow the procedure. You weren't watching what you were doing. You didn't do what you said. You didn't think before you acted. You were asleep at the wheel. If you just listened to me, this would never have happened. You didn't update the procedure. Well, you didn't provide the information I needed to make a good decision, so it is your fault, all right? So if you're used to hearing that kind of language, my guess is that many of your investigations are probably hanging up in that human level. Now, as I said, blaming others who are in the room is a dangerous thing. So I color coded it red. So let's move over to the pink one. The pink one is the not my fault category of my somebody's fault tree. All right, and in this category, I'm just trying to make sure that the room knows it wasn't me. All right, so in this one, I've got some things that you might have heard. There's some way it's their fault, and it might even be your fault, but it ain't my fault. It's my parents' fault. It was an act of God. Blame it on the dog, the kids, the neighbor. The data's wrong. Obviously, stuff just happens, and my favorite, the boss told me to, so it is not my fault. All right, so how many of you have heard those? 
So the last category I put in my somebody's fault tree was the their fault category. Now I coded this one blue because quite frankly, this is your safe box. This is the one you go to when you really don't want to have an argument over there in the your fault category and you don't want to look like you're just trying to push it off on everybody else in the not my fault category. So what you see here is it's their fault. It's their fault. We know it's their fault. They said they would do it. I heard they did it too. If they didn't do it, they would be here. They didn't guard it from happening. They didn't give me enough money to do it right. They didn't give me enough capital money to do it right. They never give me enough time. They're just plain lazy, those operators. They never pay attention. Heck, we tried to tell them. So if you're in a situation where this is some of the words that you might be hearing as you go through your RCA, my guess is in most of those cases, you are stuck at the human level. So again, I put this together really in jest, really to have a little fun with it. But if you're stopping at that human level and you're just blaming people, this at least gives them a way to defend themselves. Now let's, let's talk a little bit more about what good looks like and let's go a little deeper into this. So what I've done is I put up one of our little single point lessons here and I wanna take you guys through three tools here on the call today. And as we go through these three tools, you may have seen some of these in your facility. Now, the first one you see is the five blue boxes, and that really represents a tool that's been around for quite some time. Uh, many folks who have implemented Lean or Six Sigma will recognize this tool, but even others that haven't uh, implemented Lean with Six Sigma or our production system within your organization, you still may recognize our good friend Five Wise. And Five Wise is a very simple tool most three, four, five, six-year-olds are really, really well equipped to use this tool. Um, unfortunately, so are a lot of organizations as well. So what the five whys does is it helps us drill down into the problem. It helps us drill down past those physical roots, past those human roots, into those systemic and latents. So I often say, you know, five whys, it is a good tool. It helps us problem solve on the floor, but five whys is probably not enough to help you understand what's happening with a major gearbox that has failed. So if we take that five why and we start to branch it out, and as we branch it out now, we've got multiple things that are causing the box above. So if the box at the top was a fire, as an example, and I ask you to do a five Y, you would have to pick either something burned because it was flammable, something burned because it was ignited, or something burned because there was oxygen in the air. Because we all know fire takes three elements in order to be created. I guess they're not elements. It takes three states in order for you to get a fire. You've got to have oxygen. You've got to have ignition and you've got to have fuel. And if you don't have those things, you won't get the thing above it. And that's what I love about leaving the five Y behind and transferring into what we call the fault tree, the branched five Y. And that is that now I can go and I can look at all of the things that contributed to it and I can prioritize those things. I can look at which one has the lowest cost solution. I can look at which one reduces the risk to an acceptable level for the money that I'm willing to spend. I can really dive into it and possibly find a root cause type solution that is much lower cost. And to give you an example, if you were using the five whys and you had a fire, if you said it was because there was oxygen in the air, you could address that issue. But Halon and FM2 and all the other oxygen removing chemicals are very expensive and not that great for the environment. So by bringing those other options in, you're actually increasing your cost substantially. You're also adding a new element of risk because humans are not very compatible with Halon. 
So in that situation, we want to make sure that we're looking at all the causes for that fire, not just that oxygen. And I know that's a almost a ludicrous example because of course there had to be oxygen. But think about how many problems in your facility today that you run into and somebody does a very simple 5Y and you end up with this crazy complicated solution that, that's probably going to introduce more risk than just leaving it the way it was. So if you take that 5Y, you branch it out into that fault tree. Now you take that fault tree and you add in two symbols, the and and the or that you see below. So I like to call them the tombstone and the Star Trek symbol. All right, if you add those into your fault tree, you now have what's called a logic tree. And a logic tree allows us to see where things come together to create problems or where multiple things could cause problems to happen. So when you see that and up there at the top, right under that box, what you're seeing is in fact that all three of those boxes have to exist in the same place at the same time before that issue to happen. Now, if you drill down a little deeper into that problem, you can see about three levels down there in the gray boxes, there is an or. And what I'm saying there is this box or that box could cause the problem above. And that problem combines with the one next to it to give me the problem above it. So what you're seeing is we took a 5Y, we branched it, and then we added in ands and ors. So now we've got three tools and we can use the right tool for the job that we're doing. Now, some folks just swear five whys is enough. But what I will tell you at the end of the day, when you're looking into gearbox problems, when you're looking into motor failures, when you're looking into conveyor and chain brakes and all the other things that we run into in the facility, there is never going to be one root cause. In fact, the whole premise behind root cause analysis really ought to be changed. It ought to be root causes analysis because at every level of every problem, there is an action and there is a condition. There is something that happens instantaneously and there is something that exists over a long period of time. So if we go back up to my fire example, we didn't drill down into it, but if we go up to my fire example, Oxygen, hopefully, has existed for a long time and will continue to. The ignition source, usually, not always, but usually the ignition source is instantaneous. Somebody flipped a lighter, someone sparked a wire. It's an instantaneous issue. And then fuel, in many cases, is a longer term condition that has existed. Now, it doesn't have to be that way with every scenario. And I know we could come up with examples where it isn't. But my point for you guys is today, if you're only using five whys, you're only seeing one action or one condition. And I will promise you, at the end of the day, there is an action and a condition at every level in every branch. And in many cases, there'll be two or three more of each. So with that said, I've given you a look at three tools here today. Five whys branches to a fault tree, fault tree then branches or then you add in the symbols to become a logic tree and what that allows us to do is really understand our problems in a lot more detail now i put a, a real simple example up here but there's two big concepts that we've talked about today in this webinar we've talked about the fact that there are physical causes human causes systemic causes and latent causes and we talked about the fact the physical ones you can see out there the human ones, Bubba did something wrong. The systemic ones is what allowed Bubba to make that mistake. And the latent ones are what in the organization drove the system to let the human do the physical thing. So when you think about that, are you drilling down into those systemic and latent roots, first of all? And then secondly, are you considering all of the actions and conditions that exist at each of those levels? Now, don't be surprised if you get more than one or two boxes in one level. In fact, I don't even recommend putting swim lanes up and trying to keep it in the swim lanes because many times I can actually go three, four, maybe even five wise deep and still be at the physical level. 
So that is very much possible that it takes that long to hit the human level and then move on past it. Now, um, a couple things to remember, and these are big points. So if, if you've heard what I've said today about the fact that you need actions and conditions, and you've heard what I said today about uh, physical, human, systemic, and latent, this is probably the third big point. If you d address your problems lower down in the systemic and latent roots, your chance of reoccurrence drops significantly, but the labor and effort that you have to put into it will also be significantly increased in many cases. So just keep that in mind, and you can kind of see my curve running down the page there. As you get deeper in, there's more potential value in solving the problem, but there's also more potential effort that it will take to change the culture of the organization down there in those latent roots. So many times we, we try to understand the problem all the way to the systemic and latent roots, but we may put a solution in place in the systemic or human levels just because of the cost associated with taking it further. So if you take this now and you bring this back to what we talked about earlier with the uh, the predictive maintenance tools, those predictive maintenance tools in many cases are giving us the failure. They may be providing a little bit of the physical, but unless you're really pushing it, they're not moving you down into those human roots. Now I wanted to show just a quick example of what one of these might look like. And this one's not finished, but it's it was a fun one we did in a class exercise a while back. And we were really looking at why RCA initiatives fail. You know, so we've got a great predictive program. We're finding lots of good stuff, but we're just not getting to the root cause. We're still having those reoccurring failures or we're adding more risk in because we're just willy-nilly making changes to the equipment thinking we understand the problem. So what I did is I actually started drilling down with the class and we started looking at all the different causes as you move down. Now we didn't take the time to finish this, but it does give you a little bit of an idea for what this might look like. And you can even see some of those underlying issues down there lower on the page that are in those systemic and latent levels. So super quick example, but I always like to have a few of those that are real from the real world. Um, what I want to do now as we kind of wrap the day up is just give you guys a few hints or a few uh, ways to miss pitfalls. And so I've added just a few slides in here as we kind of uh, wrap this up. And, and what I want to go through is what I've seen that you want to avoid to miss the pit pitfalls that in many cases I have fallen in as I've implemented these over the years. So the first one you see here, uh, what you're looking at is a very complicated software package that someone spent a ton of money on and they've spent days training on and they are ready to do root calls. Um, I, I just don't think it's necessary. I don't think you have to start your root calls analysis efforts with complicated software. You'll notice the example that I showed you earlier was just post-it notes on a whiteboard or actually in that case on a foam board. So you don't need expensive tools, you don't need expensive software. In fact, I think if more people would take more time learning how to use the root cause analysis tools and actually using them in the facility, even if they're on a whiteboard or a window or anything, they would get more results than trying to capture every one of them in some software package so that they can be shared with everyone else in the world. Now, I'm not opposed to software, guys and gals. It's For me, it's one of those things where there is a first step and a second. Software does make it faster to sort through problems later. St software allows us to see where there are trends and things are happening uh, in different areas or occurring in different ways. There's a lot of value to the software, but if you can't do more than 20 or 30 good logic tree or at least fault tree type investigations a year, you don't need software. You need time and post-it notes. So that's a little bit of a soapbox topic for me, but it's a problem that I see over and over. I mean, if you're getting RCA training and you're spending two or three days learning how to do RCAs, but in fact, you're spending a day to a day and a half learning how to use the software, you just lost a lot of potential there from my perspective. 
Second uh, pitfall I see is that people don't take the time to create a good charter. And I've put up an A3 charter here, uh, something that any of you that are in the lean world are probably very familiar with. Mine has a couple extra boxes. But what I'm doing here is I'm making it very clear what we're doing, what it's costing us, what it looks like, why it's important. And then I'm drilling down into the root causes and understanding what I want the future to look like and how I'm going to get there and what metrics I'm going to measure to make that successful. So many times not having a good problem statement or a good clear charter can lead people into solving a problem that isn't the problem at all. And the best little simple example I can give you is years ago, I, uh, was doing a root cause investigation on a piece of equipment in a, in a production line and, and it was misfeeding. So we started investigating it and diving deeper into it and trying to understand if it was seizing or it had lubrication issues or if it wasn't set up properly. And then we were gonna branch down and dig down into them. But what we discovered was our problem statement was wrong. It wasn't actually a problem with the equipment. It was a problem with the air supply. So we had to go back to our charter. We had to go back to our problem statement and open it up and say, hey, you know, the problem is not the piece of equipment. The problem is the variability and lack of flow over here on this air system. So in that situation, we needed to go and address that issue. And that wasn't the case in this one, but it very well could have been. I could have gone and grabbed my ultrasonic gun and found a bunch of leaks in the line and, and all of a sudden cleaned up, tightened up, got those leaks taken care of, and my problem goes away on a piece of equipment that I thought was the problem. So my point here is make sure you have a very clear problem statement, a very clear charter for where you're going. And if you have to change it because you learned something new, that's okay. The next thing that I feel like is absolutely critical for good RCA is having a process. What are you going to do? When are you going to do it? How bad is it before you make that move? And one of the big steps in here is having triggers. When are you going to do an RCA? Because more often than not, people do too many RCAs. Well, I shouldn't say that. More often than not, people don't do RCAs. But secondly is they do too many and they can't get good investigations done. They can't get the findings implemented in the organization. And there is no value in an RCA until we change something that delivers results. So from that perspective, having a process is absolutely critical. And I mentioned having a good problem statement earlier. We, we absolutely believe that that charter and that problem statement is 100% is critical to you being successful within the process. I've given you a few examples of some problem statements here, and you can see they're a little ambiguous. In fact, you can see that the solutions, while they may indeed address the problem that's mentioned, they're probably not going to keep it from coming back. The last thing that I'll talk about today is root cause analysis is not a one tool pony. It is not something where you just have one way of doing it. There are time related tools that we teach within our RCA classes that help you to see how things fit together. There are transparency based tools like FMEAs that allow you to see lots of issues and how they're affecting a piece of equipment or a process. And then there are the tree based tools that we talked about today as we've gone through this presentation. I firmly believe just like I wouldn't show up to work on my car with nothing more than a screwdriver, I can't show up to do root cause analysis with nothing more than a 5Y. It just won't get me where I want to go, or at least it won't get me there efficiently. So to kind of put a bow on this thing today, big issue that I see with many facilities is their predictive maintenance program has more evidence than they're using. So putting that evidence in and making that part of your root cause investigation, taking those oil samples, even on small gearboxes, bringing all of that data to your root cause process can be a game changer. Secondly, make sure that you're drilling down into the systemic and latent roots, even if you don't end up addressing them there. 
Third, make sure you're looking at both actions and conditions, not one or the other, or not just one at a time. And then lastly, we talked about having a clear process, having clear problem statements. Um, and, and those are absolutely critical to being able to sustain a root cause uh, implementation for more than just a couple of weeks. So with that said, I hope you grab some things that you could uh, use and take away. We, uh, we love this topic of RCA. We think it has a great benefit for a lot of organizations. Our IBL students uh, all the time are finding problems that, that end up per really generating huge return on investments because they finally truly understand why something is happening. So if root cause is something you're interested in, reach out to me. I'd love to chat with you more. Love to share with you some of the, the things that we have available from that perspective. Uh, but I hope you have enjoyed the session today. And I am going to close up with one last poll, Maureen, if you don't mind. And that is, do you have a robust RCA process, number five? All right. And I think I can vouch for the fact that Sean and Iridicio single-handedly keep uh, 3M in business with their post-it note purchasing <laughs> and use. Yes, yeah, we use quite a few post-it notes. <laughs> they are handy. All right, let's see here. We're about 50% of folks have chimed in. And middle of the road 52 percent mine is solidly mediocre and driven by <laughs> how loud the boss yells um and then you got about 30 percent at a yes and 16 percent are a hot mess so oh, there you go right. very good very good well i hope today as you've listened you've got some things you could take away some tools you can use if you want to talk more about it as i said reach out but at this point i'm going to go ahead and switch over to maureen and let her uh, see if there are any questions yeah so um we don't have a ton of time but one question here that i think would probably benefit everybody someone's wondering um sean if you've got any books or resources that you've found helpful as you've kind of navigated your way through um, understanding uh, root causes as, as well as you do. So any any resources you could share, um, I think that would benefit. Sounds okay. good. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have a ton of resources. In fact, there are quite a few resources over on the help.irdcio.com uh, site that are available to you for free. Um, if you uh, go to the reliabilitynow.com blog and go down to the word cloud and look at root cause analysis or RCA, that's going to bring you a lot of resources that you can look at as well and kind of take back with you. Uh, so there's two good places to go to, uh, to grab stuff that won't cost you anything at all. Um, but the biggest thing I would say at the end of the day is, is getting in there and, and doing them. Uh, you know, work your way through them, uh, see how they relate. You're going to find it's 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 somewhat fun, but definitely rewarding when you start digging into these things. Awesome. All right. Well, um, if we if you if a couple of you had a couple of things you're looking for some advice from Sean on, so we'll be sure we get those questions over to him, and and he can follow up with you offline. Um, we did record this session. I think a couple folks were asking about that. So if you missed that at the beginning, this was being recorded. So if you need to uh, go back and reference um, something that, that Sean had mentioned or you want to share this out with your team, um, we'll have it up online uh, later today. And if you want specifically me to send you the link, just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to do that. Um, so just to wrap up, and Sean, thank you. Awesome presentation. Um, really appreciate um, all the content that you and your team have, have put together for everybody over the last uh, couple months. Um, and we're not done yet. So we've got one more week um, of kind of these joint efforts that we're that we've been doing. So next week, and we'll get an invite out on Monday. Uh, we're going to have two more webinars. Uh, we've got James coming back from Iridicio talking uh, more work management stuff. Um, so specifically making sure your work gets done. Um, if you've heard the webinars James has already done kind of in this series for us, you know that he, he definitely knows what he's talking about when it comes to job plans and things like that. So um, I, I know that'll be a great session to kind of tie a bow on, on what 
he's been talking about. And again, all of those webinars that he's done are archived on our YouTube page, as well as that help.iradicio.com site. So you can, you can uh, be sure to get caught up if you missed any of those. And then we're going to take the reins um, next Friday and talk electrical safety with ultrasound. It is electrical safety month. Uh, so we want to talk about how we can um, utilize ultrasound as a, a you know, really good safety application as far as electrical um, systems and equipment goes. So look forward to hopefully having you guys join us next week for those. Um, again, here's our contact info. Don't hesitate to reach out um, if you have any questions about anything we've been doing or if you, you know, have want to get in touch with the folks at Iridicio or RDI. Um, you can certainly use us as a starting point, and, and we know how to get get you in touch with whomever you need. So don't be a stranger. Um, definitely let us know if we can be of any assistance at all. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you guys back next week. And everybody have a great weekend, and we'll catch you guys later. Bye, guys.